Well, thank you. I appreciate the honor of moderating this panel today. Um, our focus on building bridges seems to become more and more interesting. I'm looking forward to our panel. The first person on our panel is Clark Shingledecker. He's a human factors psychologist and research professor at Wright State University. His current work centers on a multidisciplinary initiative to increase the representation of persons with disabilities in STEM fields. Dr. Shingle Decker has 30 years of research and development experience in university, government, and industry settings. His research interests include alternative, unconventional human system interfaces, aviation human factors, and STEM education. He has just held prior positions at the University of Nottingham. To keep the flow going, I am going to introduce the three panelists. Our next panelist, Lynn Weston from Marshall University, is a member of Marshall University's Higher Education Learning Problems, HELP, the acronym H-E-L-P. She has been there for 17 years and is the program's new director. The mission of Marshall's Help started in 1981 and is to provide assistance through individual tutoring, mentoring, and support, as well as fair and legal access to educational opportunities for students diagnosed with learning disabilities. Weston received her undergraduate degree in special education and elementary education from Marshall and her master's in education from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She later became certified in learning disabilities at Marshall, and she's currently working on her doctorate degree in leadership studies higher education. I think many of us are familiar with our third panelist, and that would be Janet Sellers. She is also with Langley Research Center. She is in the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Office. That is the Office of Equal Opportunity Programs at NASA Langley. She has a distinguished military and academic career as well as her current profession. She completed her undergraduate at the University of the State of New York and received her master's from the University of Oklahoma. She has also worked as a paralegal for the U.S. Air Force and a college administrator. Thank you, and I will look forward to our first presentation, Dr. Um Schindeldecker. Morning, everyone. Uh, today, I want to talk to you very briefly, uh, as briefly as I possibly can about uh, some primary initiatives that we have undertaken at Wright State University uh, to grow the STEM workforce uh, by uh, impacting students uh, with disabilities. Uh, and uh, once I talk about those programs, I want to end up with uh, a little bit on uh, how uh, the OSAA scholars, some of our students at Wright State and students with disabilities and other STEM programs around the country might become better connected to NASA and other uh, providers of internships and, and, and employment. Um, I want to begin real quickly by talking about the problem that I hope most of you are at least somewhat aware of. It's pretty straightforward. Too few people with disabilities uh, actually pursue post-secondary education, that is, and going to college. Uh, fewer still uh, enter the STEM fields, uh, and those who do enter the STEM fields uh, often face significant barriers to success. And we talked a little bit about that persistence problem this morning. That is a problem with students with disabilities. Uh, here's the numbers, some of the data. These are typical data. Uh, if you look at the percentage of uh, students with disabilities that go to college, they run around about half. That's improving. Uh, there are more students with disabilities now coming into associates programs, and they tend to be almost equivalent to the numbers of students without disabilities that go into those. But uh, in a bachelor's program, uh, you can see we're down to a third, and we're even fewer on STEM majors. This also speaks a little bit to how few people go into STEM majors in general. But you can see uh, students with disabilities fall well below that. At Wright State University, uh, we've uh, attempted to address this disparity 
uh, which in fact impacts directly the uh, competitiveness, the scientific and engineering competitiveness of the country with some fairly aggressive programs. And let me briefly tell you about who we are. A lot of people don't know who Wright State is or where we are. Uh, we are a mid-sized research university located in Dayton, Ohio. We're named after uh, some STEM pioneers of our country, that is the Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, who called Dayton their home and actually really learned to fly in Dayton. Sorry, North Carolina. But uh, we have approximately just under 20,000 undergrad and grad students in nine schools and colleges. There's 91 bachelor's degrees and 76 graduate professional degree programs, uh, including in engineering and sciences, and there's also a medical school at Wright State. Uh, so we're out there. Uh, one of the things that Wright State is, happens to be known for, and I won't go into a long story about it, is its Office of Disability Services, which, although your program says I'm from that office, I'm very closely associated with them. I'm actually from the uh, science and engineering side of the house. But uh, the Office of Disability Services, wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing without them. But they're nationally recognized for a very broad-ranging program that goes well beyond uh, the requirements of ADA to serve students with disabilities. We have a, a large number of disabilities with uh, students with disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, that probably may not be in college if they weren't at Wright State because of some of the services provided. Uh, but we have all types of disabilities, about 500 served annually. And the programs that within that office are very much focused on independence and employment. And it's because of the sort of uh, disability inclusive culture that we have at Wright State University, even though most of the students do not have disabilities, uh, that we have a strong link between uh, our uh, student uh, uh, programs, that is like ODS, and our STEM academic departments and research initiatives, especially those who are concerned with broadening participation in STEM. Uh, and that's really uh, where my work comes from. Uh, our STEM initiatives are primarily aimed at the same initiative, the same goals as we have here at this conference. Uh, that is, what we want to do is increase the number of students with disabilities that go into post-secondary education, primarily bachelor's programs, and uh, pursue careers in STEM disciplines. And I want to briefly talk about our, our approach to this because this is something that we spent a lot of time trying to develop. Uh, although I, I presume that you'll find them largely in, uh, intuitive. One of the things that we like to do is to make sure that all of the in interventions that we introduce are barrier focused. Uh, and let me show you specifically what I mean by that. We have a very simple model of the kinds of barriers that, to success that students with disabilities have regardless of the level that they enter into uh, STEM interest. Uh, and uh, this model, you can probably look at it and say, you know, we don't focus specifically, although you see them in here, on the nature of disability, but rather those common problems that uh, many underrepresented students have in, in succeeding in STEM fields and in college in general. One is interest and motivation. We try to make sure that our uh, that where appropriate, that our, our interventions are growing interest and motivation, and there are a lot of reasons why that doesn't happen for students with disabilities. Uh, we also look at opportunity, and that is not just the opportunity provided within the university or provided by employers, but also that self-imposed opportunity and the opportunity limitations imposed by parents and teachers sometimes. Uh, oops. A third area is in personal or psychosocial skills. These were mentioned about briefly this morning about the importance of becoming integrated within the environment. And uh, for students with disability, a lot of this has to do with self-determination, self-advocacy, persistence. And then finally, academic preparation, as in other underrepresented groups. Numbers, many students come in with an interest in STEM, but inappropriate preparation uh, for that. So we try to make sure that our interventions address those. And then the second uh, component of our approach to the goal is that, uh, that these interventions need to be progressive. That is, you can't just decide that as students uh, who are seniors in high school and say we're going to make them into STEM professionals. Uh, we all know that we develop our interests and we limit our interests very early on. And so we have interventions that target very young students, uh, facilitate the transition to college, support persistence in the major. We know persistence is a problem and preparing for success in professions which we kind of represent with this little stairway to heaven. And we actually do have programming at different levels. Uh, and although we're very interested in higher education, I'm going to mention some of our entry level things right here. We have a program, and I have brochures on the two programs I'm going to mention here, 
with me if anyone has any interest in learning about them, not so much in terms of drawing people to the right state because neither of these programs are really oriented toward that, but are oriented directly at the goal of getting the students with disabilities into higher education and careers. Starting Right is actually a program where it's aimed at beginning with middle school and going through our um, uh, early high school years. Uh, it's largely internet based, and you'll notice the Wright brothers here are not flying one of their airplanes, but what they really learned to fly in Dayton, which was gliders, and learned how to uh, warp wings and achieve controlled flight. Putting the motor on was not that big of a deal. Uh, the Starting Right program is essentially internet based, where our objectives are to raise interest in STEM as a viable educational focus and career option for students with disabilities, and to help them build personal skills and promote academic preparation. We do live webcasts uh, to students with disabilities. Uh, we provide podcasts online. We have online website resources for all the stakeholders and student success. And uh, I'd like you, if you get a chance, just uh, Google up here or go out to www.startingright.org. And uh, if you go there, you can uh, play a little video that tells you all about that program uh, right in the middle there. And you'll see that we have different tracks or pathways for students, parents, and actually for teachers and vocational rehabilitation counselors trying in all these cases to get these students interested in and on the pathway. What I really want to talk about today, though, is, is this program. Ohio STEM Ability Alliance is uh, largely uh, supported by an NSF uh, grant, a Research and Disabilities Education Alliance grant. Uh, and it focuses primarily on that transition to college, on getting the uh, getting students a high quality STEM education while at college, and then getting them into careers. Uh, basically, uh, as I said, we are in high school and college level. Uh, we're able to recruit, retain, graduate, and transition students. And uh, our partners, Wright State is the lead university. Our partner is Ohio State University, and then we have community colleges, k schools, and STEM employers. So all the stakeholders are involved. Okay, so uh, basically the, the, the piece I want to focus on here uh, today is the OSAA Scholars Program. And this, the Scholars Program is a comprehensive program that supports for uh, college students with disabilities. Uh, what we we're trying to do is recruit them into the STEM fields, maximize retention and persistence, and optimize their preparation for entry to STEM jobs or graduate programs. Uh, and this is kind of a slide that I use to sell that program, if you will, to, uh, to uh, recruit students to it. Uh, if you look at this, you would, uh, I certainly would jump right in if I was offered this program. But uh, we have something I'll mention a little bit more, which is uh, the concept of a comprehensive ability advisor, whose job is to uh, help the students achieve their academic and uh, career goals. We have a first-year stu student learning community uh, that all of our students participate in to join the program, a monthly scholars meetings to keep them uh, integrated with the program and, uh, and engaged. Uh, we have special tutoring services for high-level uh, STEM courses that are difficult to find otherwise. Adaptive technology support. We have an incentive program called Scholars Dollars where students by participation in, in sort of out-of-class STEM activities can uh, earn money to go to conferences, uh, to get uh, equipment and materials that, is, uh, that are focused on those STEM interests. We have mentoring by upper class STEM students and STEM professionals. Uh, we have internships and research opportunities that I'd like to talk about later. And we also have a chance to apply for students to apply for Cuse Ohio for scholarships that are reserved for these students with the second grant that we earn. So we try to focus on all of those things that, uh, that uh, account for uh, poor retention sometimes in STEM fields, uh, which, whether it's financial support, uh, whether it's uh, the academic uh, limitations that students may have when they come in, and also for what it takes to be a really good STEM student, to be an outstanding student that gets into grad school or gets the top jobs. Uh, a central focus of this program, I wanted to say that is relatively unique, is our OSA Ability Advisor. This is the person who is involved directly with each student, uh, who uh, basically works with them to, uh, to achieve their goals. And this is broadly modeled on uh, NCAA student advising programs that uh, they use kind of for Division I athletes. Um, this, uh, it's similar in the sense that it recognizes a lot of the barriers that these two types of students have with time demands and academic risks. And so we kind of use this as a way to approach these students. Uh, we use intrusive uh, advising techniques so the students sign up for this advisor knowing exactly what's going on. 
But the advisor plays many roles, ranging from mentor, coach, advocate, and facilitator. So uh, it's a very, we found this to have been a very effective part of our program and brings together all of the services that you see here in blue. So we have this direct relationship between the advisor and the scholar, uh, STEM faculty and academic advisors that we find to be um, successful in our work. And, uh, I think it's, it's one of those ideas that is, it could be very well applicable to a lot of other, other, other underrepresented groups. I want to talk a little bit about outcomes. This has been mentioned a lot today, and we're, we've certainly come under the pressure of being able to show uh, what's actually happening in these programs. Are they effective? And I think we have some good evidence that they are. Uh, both of the programs I've talked about are about three years old. Uh, the first the one for uh, younger students is uh, had various sponsors. We're looking for a sponsor right now, but we've had quite a bit of success with it. We've had over 2,000 website visits just in in the June and August period this year uh, to access the podcasts and college preparation resources. Uh, we actively recruit these students to follow on OSAA interventions in a, uh, in a, um, a summer uh, campus uh, visit program. Essentially, it's a, it's, it is sort of a college boot camp that we do a five-day camp called First Building Youth. And we've had 11 students from that program uh, come into uh, First Building Youth and go on to majors as I've stated. Uh, just briefly, our students, we, are, we have 95 uh, Wright State University students who are OSAA scholars right now. Uh, that is, um, uh, we've grown that from about uh, 40 to start with in the first year. Uh, you can see over on the left what majors they're in. They're kind of split between the science, School of Science and Math, College of Science and Mathematics, and the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, and you can see the wide range of disabilities that, that we try to cover. Uh, we have, uh, you can see about a quarter of our students are, uh, have uh, physical disabilities uh, that are orthopedic in nature. We have students with uh, 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 sensory disabilities, hard of hearing, uh, vision, uh, but you see the full range of non-visible disabilities, psychiatric, ADHD, uh, specific learning disabilities, and so on. So we address all these students in this program. Briefly, some ideas of indicators. This is a, it gives you some baseline uh, impact on STEM enrollment. What you see here is the percent of students with disabilities at Wright State University over uh, years uh, at the university starting in 2006. And you can see that just under 30% of students uh, uh, were enrolled in STEM majors at Wright State. Uh, and you can see where OSAA recruitment started and we have had a nice increase. The blue line at the bottom is the actual uh, percentage of students who are actually OSAA STEM scholars. So there's been uh, what we can say a correlation, and we'd like to call it an impact. Uh, forgetting too much about the words, essentially this is a, what we're we seeing in terms of retention and graduation. We're a little early to get our first graduates, although we do have some. But just to give you an idea about the retention problem, if you go nationally for four-year college students, the, the number of students who persist to graduation ranges from about 42 to 54 percent. That's not even in STEM. And at Wright State, overall, we get about a, a, a one-year persistence of 71 percent and two-year 56. You see our OSA scholars, these are students with disabilities in STEM, uh, so this under, uh, underestimates that. You can see that one year we're getting uh, 90 to almost 100 percent, and for two years, 70 percent. So, we look like we're on track to increasing graduates, and that's what our real goal is. So far, we've got 10 graduates, uh, two in grad school, and two preparing for grad school. So that kind of gives you an overview of our program. As I said, we have two brochures. I just want to talk briefly about our needs. I talked about our needs to increase engagement and partnerships out there in the industry, in the government, uh, to get our students those kind of uh, vital uh, internships and research experiences. This is something where we, we certainly need to grow. Uh, we think there are mutual benefits here with the STEM institutions providing essential internships and research experiences. And OSAA provides uh, uh, both uh, mentors and, and uh, internship providers with uh, accommodations, assistance, and disability awareness. So it's kind of we're looking to prepare uh, you to accept these students, but also to make it easier for you to see how students with disabilities might come in and contribute to your workforce. The outcomes, of course, is that we get uh, well-prepared students for the RFP workforce. This is what makes the difference, as we all know, internships and research experiences. 
between the student who just gets a degree and a student who's ready for a career. Uh, and we think that the opposite effect is that we have some employers who are eagerly ready for those workers to come in and uh, make a strong contribution. So uh, we would definitely like to be in contact with you all and anyone who has interest in our programs. As again, we aren't just interested in recruiting people to write state, but to the overall problem that this conference is devoted to. And so these are our two programs, and that's my reference down here. Can I say questions to the end? Okay. Welcome. I'm really excited about what I've learned about NASA in the last day or two. But I'm, I'm the director, as, as Kathy mentioned, of the Marshall University Health Program. That's higher education for learning problems. At Marshall, we do have a program for all students with disabilities, but our program focuses specifically on specific learning disabilities and students with ADHD or both. And in the past couple of years, we've had students that are also identified as having learning disabilities and Asperger's syndrome. So what I thought I'd do was just take about eight minutes and show you exactly what we do at the HELP program. And then I thought that would be, uh, then I'll take a few minutes after that just to tell you how we build bridges for success with our students. So we'll watch a little quick video. 